All right, guys, we have something really special for you guys today on the We Make Supplements podcast. We're going to be talking about a very controversial topic, flavor systems. I got none other than Sean Marzalek here to talk about flavor systems with us. How's your day going? Doing well, Encore. How are you today? I mean, I'm doing good, man. I think you're kind of like the original man that taught me how flavor systems work and uh, what goes into making a flavor system. But I feel like no one at home understands it at all. Right. So let's talk about it. I mean, like when you want a chocolate protein, do you just like go buy some chocolate flavoring from one place and dump it into a tub of protein and like mix it with like a stick and like all of a sudden it's chocolate <laughs> protein? Like how does it work? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, no, I mean, there's hundreds of different chocolate flavors, right? Is one of the most uh, difficult things is when somebody's wanting a certain flavor and they'll say, hey, I want a chocolate flavor. And our, our question usually is, well, what kind of chocolate do you like? I mean, just like any other um, category, right? Do you like dark chocolate, milk chocolate? Um, there's so many different types of chocolates that you got to try to figure out what the customer wants first, right? And there's hundreds of chocolate flavors. And so, yeah, there's no, at, at least at our facility, there's no like, oh, this person wants chocolate flavored protein. Let's go grab the chocolate flavor in the lab and throw it in with the protein, mix it up with the, the sweetener and send it to them. We're usually working with trying to figure out what kind of chocolate they want. And then we're u utilizing a portfolio of, of chocolate flavors that we have probably in this facility, I would say at least 20. Okay. And typically we're, we're mixing and matching and layering different chocolate flavors and cocoa to get to a certain taste profile that somebody's looking for. Wait, let's talk about that. You said the word layer different chocolate profiles. What does that mean? Yeah, so typically, I mean, when I first started out in this industry, before we were manufacturing and before I got into doing our own flavor systems, uh, that's a whole nother story where I turned my dining room into a lab at one point and had, you know, a thousand bottles of flavors in there and it didn't go over well with the girl I was dating. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Time, right? <laughs> but, you know, it seems a lot of people will send, a lot of manufacturers will send product out to a flavor house and say, hey, we need, you know, this customer wants a chocolate flavor that's kind of salty or, you know, extra dark or whatever. And the flavor house sends back the protein with the flavor in it and the manufacturer's like, great. And then they send it to the customer and, and try to get it approved, right? To where what we're doing here is, is we're utilizing all of our flavors and we're mixing different flavors from different flavor houses, right, to get a profile. Because everyone has their own little art when they're making the actual flavors. And we try to take that art and become our own artist with mixing different chocolate flavors to get a profile that you couldn't get if someone just made that flavor for you. Oh, that's interesting. So I know when we were first starting in the supplement industry, you know, we assume that there's going to be like scientists with like lab coats with like beakers and like eyedroppers trying to figure out how to create these formulas for us. Yeah. But like in the actual science of it, I mean, is, is this just like trial and error? of like mixing different flavor combinations to get something the way that the customer wants? I mean, it's trial and error, but with some, you know, educated guesses and with some history of working with these flavors, right? right We've been course, working with these flavors now for on our own for almost nine years. So we kind of get a sense when we understand the profile someone's looking for, whether it's chocolate. I mean, same thing with vanilla, right? I mean, there's vanilla bean, there's creamy vanilla, there's ice cream vanilla, right? There's so many different vanillas. Once we get that sense, then, yeah, there is some educated uh, guessing going on with utilizing different flavors and getting feedback from the customers. But typically, like when we're providing a, a flavor sample to somebody, uh, I don't want to speak categorically across the, the board, right? But, I mean, we usually get within the second sample we send them, they're usually happy. So we, we send them something based on the initial um, – feedback that they're asking for they might taste it say hey i want this to be a little bit more sweeter or hey can you add a little bit more you know kind of like a vanilla caramel type twist to this we take that feedback we get them a sample and we're pretty good at kind of making that educated guess just based on our history with working with flavors all right well forget chocolate chocolate's easy yeah. like how are you doing these um these new trending flavors there's stuff like cinnamon toast crunch apple jacks um kit kat how, how does all that happen I mean, do you, do you end up calling like Post or Kellogg saying, hey, we're, we're trying to make your cereal? Or is there someone in the back that's sitting there mixing all these different things together to 
try and like remake it. Yeah, no, we're we're doing that back here in our lab. Um, you know, we've we can basically take any flavor that somebody wants. I know there's specifically there was a, a customer at one point that wanted a flavor of a famous cookie in Australia, right? There was a flavor called uh, there's a famous cookie in Australia called Tim Tam. Okay. Right? I never heard of a Tim Tam. Yeah. And I don't think if you live in the U.S., you would never hear of it. Uh, so, you know, we bought some Tim Tams off of Amazon, I believe, uh, and we tasted these cookies. And then we got in the lab and started saying, okay, well, how, how do you get that little twist? So, you know, sometimes you're starting out with a vanilla base and you're adding these different things to it. Or the cereal proteins, to your example. You know, how are you getting that cinnamon flavor into something? Are you adding different bits? Uh, we do have suppliers that provide... Um, the cereal bits and stuff like that, but you still got to create the flavor around it. It's not like you're having a vanilla protein and just throwing in a cinnamon toast crunch bit into there and all of a sudden it tastes like cinnamon toast crunch. There's typically like on our vanilla flavors and some of our unique flavors, there's sometimes anywhere from typically two to up to five different flavors in a flavor system. Okay. So I know it's more of an art than it is a science. We're going to jump into something really controversial now. Okay, owning your flavor system. So I know most manufacturers wouldn't even tell me how they made our flavors. And uh, whenever I got these spec sheets, it would break down, you know, this is the protein content or if it was like a pre-workout. These are all the stims. These are the the things. And then it would just say flavor system. Yeah. So what's that about? Like, why is it that manufacturers hold out on letting you know what's in the flavor system? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So when it comes to the flavor systems, obviously, there's a lot of time. Like I said, we've been doing this for nine years, right? Right. Um, And so there's a lot of time and effort and knowledge and skill and artistry that goes into creating flavor systems. And when you have a reputation of creating great flavors for whatever category, proteins, BCAs, whatever it is, you know, there's a lot of uh, IP that's involved in that, right? So if somebody wants to come over and have you do some product development and then says, oh, yeah, and I want my flavor system for this. And it's, you know, they haven't haven't done any business with you. You don't know if they're going to do any business with you. Now, all of a sudden, you're spreading around this knowledge and know-how to people um, that may or may not do business with you, right? Or may may take that flavor system and say, hey, look, that's great, but, you know, you came in 20 cents higher on your quote, so I'm taking your flavor system because I liked it better, and I'm going to give another manufacturer mm. the business, right? So, it's kind so of you've got to protect yourself a little right. bit against that. Yeah, there's some secret sauce there. Um, that being said, I also understand the customer side of this, right? where if somebody's building a really great business, uh, and a lot of people build businesses to, to sell them, right? I mean, that's pretty typical with entrepreneurs. They wanna build something, create a lot of value, um, and, and sell the business. And I've seen a lot of large companies that don't own their flavor systems and they're scrambling when they're in an acquisition or a potential acquisition and they're scrambling for their flavor systems because it's it's causing them problems with the company that wants to acquire them. They're like, well, you don't even know what's in your product. So I understand that side of it as well. And we kind of have a flexi- flexible approach here at SDC where we kind of create um, agreements with companies. We have companies, really large companies, and some companies that, that are, you know, w- you wouldn't consider really large companies. And we have different agreements uh, to protect us and protect the customer in, in case, you know, God forbid a hurricane blows our facility over and the customer needs to have a backup uh, to go somewhere else. We have sometimes we have our flavor systems in escrow um, where the customers have access to those flavor systems under certain circumstances. Uh, we have this is Pittsburgh, man. It just rains here. There's no hurricanes or tornadoes. <laughs> Tor- there are tornadoes. We haven't in had Pittsburgh? one in a while. Yeah, we haven't had one in a while, but there's oh, definitely man. tornadoes around here. You're not winning this argument of making me want to stay in Pittsburgh, man. <laughs> You know, fires happen, different things happen, right? So you, you, I think that what it comes down to is the manufacturer has to protect themselves, right? Of because course. there's a lot of money and time and R&D that has went into, um, you know, their lab and their, their process, right, of creating flavor systems. And at the same time, I think customers, looking at this objectively, the customers should have be protected in cer- certain circumstances as well. Okay, so there's there's some brands out there that are probably smaller, right? And there's some brands out there that are larger. I mean, at what point is the right time to have that conversation with your manufacturer? Um, I mean, that's a good question. I, I don't know if there's a specific time. I'll give you a few examples, right? They, they, could they come to mind? I mean, if a company's growing really quickly, right, and they, they know that they're building a business for an exit, and that's on their mind is like, hey, I want to own these flavor systems, make sure that everything, I'm getting all my ducks in a row. Uh, and they come to us, and we've been doing business for a while. 
you know, it, it's an easy conversation to have is like, like I said, there's certain parameters we can put in place to release those flavor systems. I mean, somebody could just say, hey, look, I'm willing to pay you X amount of dollars and I want to own the flavor systems, right? Uh, some customers that we, we work with, you know, they utilize two or three manufacturers. So they, they, they work out agreements between the two or three manufacturers to share them, but then keep it between those manufacturers. So it's not just taking one of their uh, IPs and sending it to, you know, just jumping from manufacturer to manufacturer right, right. to save five cents, right? Uh, we recently uh, had a, a really large customer overseas uh, that, you know, their opening orders were, were significant, right? And But they said, look, you know, we, we our business model is we have to own the flavor systems. And I said, well, we've been doing R&D for you for a year, right? This was a lot. This was a, a customer that had a lot of products. Uh, a lot of flavor systems, lots of rounds of samples, trying to really tweak it to perfection across a lot of products. And so we put a lot of lab time in. There was a lot of shipping overseas of samples and things. And so in that discussion, you know, I said, look, well, I'm okay with you owning your flavor systems, but you, as you can see, we put a lot of time into this and a lot of effort. And to have that just turned over and you know, potentially lose that business after one order then you know obviously you can understand the liability that creates for me and so we worked out an agreement that the, they own their flavor systems after you know x amount of dollars in business that, that comes through sdc or uh, another customer it was a, a time period where after two years of an exclusive manufacturing contract with obviously clauses in there that say if we can't deliver for whatever reason we'll release them sooner Right, but you know, enough. but there's there's so many ways to make this work without the customer taking a stance, because some customers will be like, oh, I want my flavor system, or I give me business, and if you know, depending on where that relationship is, it might be like, okay, that's fine, you know, or it might be a customer that says, look, you know, we've been doing business a really long time, and uh, there's things changing with my business, and I want access to them, and we work out uh, how to make sure that they feel comfortable that they have access to. Them. Okay, well, let me take a second to educate. Which is very unusual in this industry, by the way, I may add. I mean, there's nothing unusual about this industry ever, right? <laughs> so, but let's take a second to just educate, you know, on a layman level, right? There's yeah. probably only two times that a brand ever needs their flavor system, right? One, when they're going international and they need to do registration documents where the Ministry of Health of that country needs to know every little detail about that product, right? And I think, two is when you're trying to sell your company, right? Because at that point, they don't want to risk that any of that IP about what's in the product is missing. Yeah. There's, there's that. a third one. What's I mean, the third? Well, I mean, look, uh, some, some brands are large enough where they do want to have spread their liability around from supply chain. Oh, right? different manufacturers. So they have a couple different right. manufacturers, and they want to be able to utilize that and, you know, make sure that they're protected. Uh, obviously, you know, as brands are growing and becoming larger, they're, they're diversifying their risk a little bit. So let's talk about that. I mean, in the history of us being in the industry, I, I mean, have there been scenarios that you could think of where like manufacturers gone up and then gone down, and all of a sudden their client list just got screwed over, and it's like we, they're scrambling to find someone new? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have any in particular names, you know, right. but obviously, you know, I've, I've heard the stories. I haven't. Let me rephrase that. I've never been close or had a relationship with a manufacturer that went up and then, and then kind of went out of business. But I've heard of stories through customers of where they were at in one place and that manufacturer either sold, went out of business, whatever the case may be. And, and they did have some issues scrambling. I've never, I've never seen a scenario where a brand had to scramble uh, because the manufacturer shut down, right? But what I have seen is that manufacturers fall apart in how they operate. Right. And then, you know, all of a sudden from a 12 week lead time, it turns to 26 weeks and they like, oh, shit, I need to go find another manufacturer. Right. How yeah. else am I going to manage this whole situation? But um, speaking of that, so then uh, let's say that manufacturer one doesn't want to give manufacturer two the flavor system. What does manufacturer two do? Uh, great question. I mean, and, and that happens, right? I mean, there's definitely manufacturers in this industry that kind of work together, understanding that, look, we, we both have, you know, a certain amount of business with a particular customer and like, let's make it easy for the customer, right? And some manufacturers, there's no relationship there. And so typically what we do, and, and this happens not just from people that are bringing business from another manufacturer to diversify their risk, but also just people that are coming in, say, blind and you know 
they've had a product on the market from a really for a really long time and don't know their flavor system and, and the, their current manufacturer won't give it to them so people will come to us and send us products all the time and say can you match this i know you guys are really good at flavoring i've heard about your lab i heard about the work you do there uh, can you match this flavor and so that's what we do we, we reverse engineer the flavor um, and that that happens all in our lab straight from buying the product or having the customer send us the product uh, we're trying it we're, we're figuring out those different notes of whatever flavor it is and that's when we pull out the the portfolio of, of flavors and say okay how do you how do you get this there and there's you know I can't think of one time that we were not able to flavor match a product for somebody uh, um, maybe there was one over the last 10 years you know there's, right. there's a, maybe one or a couple but I can't think of one for, at this moment we're pretty pretty good at it so from a brand perspective does it really matter I mean, if someone could easily, you know, remake your flavor system, you know, like these other manufacturers or, you know, just call Sean, yeah. right? Sean, okay, I need to figure out what's in my formula. Sean's like, yeah, I could figure this out in like two tries. I mean, does yeah, it really it's matter? Becoming, it's becoming irrelevant, right? I think 10, right. 15, 20 years ago, it was a big problem just because I think the technology of flavors was, was not there. I think the artistry of flavoring uh, wasn't really there. Uh, I know there's some other flavor houses and, and manufacturers out there that do a really good job now, but I, I like to pride ourselves and I take a lot of pride in how good we are at it. Um, so yeah, I think it's changed a lot. It's, it's, I mean, when customers come to us and say, Hey, you know, I'm having issues with supply chain or whatever the case, I want to diversify my risk, whatever it is. Um, but I don't have my flavor systems. Like we don't panic. We're like, okay, no problem. Just send us the products and um, usually within a couple of weeks, we can we can send them samples that kind of match their existing product. So let's say there's like a brand out there right now, and uh, you know they're ordering a crazy amount of product, and their manufacturers just aren't helping them figure out what their flavor system is. Is that something that we could just use just the lab at SDC to kind of figure that out, or? Is that like out of the scope of what you would do as a manufacturing plant? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the candid answer is everything's got uh, a price, right? <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, right? So right. if somebody wanted to utilize our lab, yes, um, that's not a problem. Obviously, we're in the business of making products. So we try to tie that into, hey, you know, instead of paying some upfront fee, why don't you utilize us, utilize our lab in exchange for, you know, a piece of your business, right? Let us earn some of your business by helping solve a problem for you. We solve right. your problem and in exchange, it works out for us because we get some business and hopefully we can continue to earn more business by delivering quality and service. I'm going to lay out some, uh, some deep truths right now, yeah. right? So I think one of my favorite parts about working with different manufacturers was that uh, when I go to these expos, there's different vendors that would take me out. Right, manufacturer A would take me out for a nice dinner. Manufacturer B would take me out for a nice dinner. My favorite experience ever was I show up to this dinner, right? And you know, I bring a couple of the team members over, and uh, you know, we're about to get some surf and turf, right? Because this is an <laughs> expo. I, you know, I've given this guy millions of dollars in the year. He's gonna, he's gonna, he's gotta take me out, right? Yeah, yeah, he's gonna do it right. This guy called his one, like one of his vendors, the people that he buys like flavor systems and things from, to take us out. And so, you know, he just like passed it down from one vendor to the next vendor. That guy called a different vendor <laughs> to come by. So the last guy at the end of this chain was going to have to pick up the tab for the hey whole man, group. Hey, that, man, that's, right? a, that's a, a, a pretty smart move on your manufacturer's <laughs> <part>. <laughs> like, This is amazing. <laughs> but what was, what was so interesting was I was surprised that he would introduce me to the guy that was buying like the bulk of our BCAA flavor systems, right? Yeah. And it was just like one house that was providing like the fruit punch that I don't think they were flavor layering at the time. But um, I was shocked, and I was just like, "So, can I introduce you to my other manufacturer?" And he was like, "Yeah, they're they're buying it from me too already." Yeah. And I was like, "Wow, that's crazy! I had no idea that like everyone in the industry just knew each yeah, other." Yeah, there's a lot of connections. You know, this is a, a big industry, but a small industry when it starts coming down to manufacturing and raw material supply and stuff like that. And that's why I don't get overly concerned about. Um, the whole flavor system and, and raw material suppliers and stuff right. like that. Nobody really has a, a magic, you know, rabbit up their sleeve, right? I mean, it's I think, like, it's I think very my favorite to scenario this stuff out. Someone calls us and they're like, listen, I need you to sign this NDA right now. We're going to come up with the best chocolate protein that's ever hit the market. And I need you to make sure that this non disclosure is signed so no one else knows about it. And I just look at them. I was like, "Are you serious? Like, there's nothing crazy about this product. Like, why are you why are you making such a big deal about getting to the first PO?" Yeah, right. And I just feel like that earlier question of at what size are you before you should really worry about these things. I mean, I'm gonna go ahead and give an answer to that. I think if you haven't sold ten thousand units, like, just calm down, check yourself, right, and focus all your energy on selling. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I I haven't thought about a particular number of units, yeah. but I mean that, that sounds right, right? Like like I said, you can't take years and years of of money spent uh, inside an organization to create something that somebody else obviously can't. That's why they're they're coming to us and just give it to them without any expectation uh, of the amount of business that they're either going to do f- with themselves or or business that they're going to do with us as as a manufacturer. It's 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 not reasonable. That being said, there are people that give us a lot of business, right? And I understand that they want to diversify um, their manufacturing, their supply chain, and, and some of their liability. Jerks. How <laughs> dare they? <laughs> I, I think at the end of the day, uh, for us, we found opportunities where uh, you know, manufacturer A and B were kind of like primary and secondary, making the bulk of our product. And I think the bigger reason for that was we were trying to figure out this thing called just-in-time shipping, okay. right? So if one manufacturer is, you know, every six to eight weeks, uh, you figure out, you know, you start alternating between different manufacturers for what you need. But when manufacturer C and D enter the picture, I think that was when things got really interesting, right? Because manufacturer C would make um, like a new flavor of our protein that was unique to them. Yeah. Right. That, you know, manufacturer A and B, you know, either one didn't have the time to figure out how to make. Right. Or didn't have the ingenuity to like approach us. Like, yo, we got this new innovative flavor and we think you should launch it. Yeah. So I think since I've been here at STC, one of the things I was I was you know really excited about was like there's some really cool flavors that, that these guys just work on in the lab just like for the hell of it. Right. I think Devin will walk up to me. But she'll just be like, hey, try this. Yeah, and I'll try it. Like, oh, Tiffany, what is this? Are we putting this in about time? She goes, no, just decided to make this new flavor to see if anyone would be interested. Yeah, no, look, it's it's a great way for manufacturers and for brands uh, to to bring value to each other, right? I mean, if you have a brand like you said that's giving a lot of business to another manufacturer, um, but they're not, you know, they're not innovative, they're not spending time in the lab, they're not presenting new ideas and innovation to the brand owner, or we can do that. And even if it's, a, if it's like, hey, we love this one particular protein or BCA flavor you did, um, and, it, and it gets you kind of in the door, I'll say, to like start doing some business and be able to show what you can do from, as a, from a manufacturer standpoint, it's a great value add um, to get business, right? And also from the brand's perspective, like you are having somebody present to you new flavors or new product categories that you aren't thinking of that are all of a sudden you launch and are turning into a new revenue stream for you. So it could work for both parties. Yeah. I mean, this whole idea of flavor systems and creating different products and supply chain management, I mean, there's an art form behind all of it, right? And it's just, it's incredible. So I I think that's everything for today's episode. I don't know if there's much else we could talk about with flavor systems. No, no. So like you said, it's a controversial uh, topic. It's something that is constantly being discussed between brand owners and manufacturers. Um, And I think it's it's one of those things that I just like to speak openly about. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, that's our episode for today. Everyone stay tuned, and uh, we'll catch you guys on the next episode. All right. Thanks, Encore.